Good morning. Buenos dias. Um, I'm pretty sure it's morning, though. It says good afternoon. Good morning. <laughs> I'm Carla Coppell. I'm a vice president here with the United States Institute of Peace. Um, as I hope you all know, but perhaps not, the U.S. Institute of Peace was created over 30 years ago as a nonpartisan national institute dedicated to the proposition that peace is possible, practical, and cost-effective. Um, and we're honored to have all of you here today for what I think will be a very rich program. Um, today's conversation marks actually the relaunch of the Columbia Peace Forum, which our beloved colleague Ginny Bouvier started in 2012, um, and to organize a conversation or a space for conversation around uh, Colombia's internal armed conflict and to discuss challenges with the peace process. Uh, uh, Ginny unfortunately passed away earlier this year, so in some ways we view the Columbia Peace Forum as a living legacy. Uh, to her good work uh, in the region uh, and to our collaboration with the Wilson Center. Um, we are honored to have Cynthia Aronson here today and to be able to um, share this relaunch with them. Um, the forum itself is, has varied in terms of its topics. Uh, it brings together academics, it brings to, with Colombian specialists, government officials and others to provide a uh, platform for a variety of voices to talk about the commitment to peace in Colombia. Um, obviously, this uh, past year has been an important one uh, where we've transitioned from the peace process with the FARC to the process of reintegration and reconciliation, as well as the negotiation of the ceasefire with the LN. And so it really is a critical time to talk about how we pivot and transition and find a path forward that leads to durable peace and uh, cessation of violence and peace and prosperity nationwide. Uh, today, in particular, we're focused on that recovery from war. Uh, and we want to cover that both from an artistic standpoint and an analytical perspective. Uh, we are honored to have the award-winning Colombian photographer Jesus Abad Colorado uh, presenting some of his photographs. That will be followed by an expert panel talking about the challenges to reintegration and victims' rights, um, which are both critical points in the accord and critical to the success of this peace process long term. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't um, thank uh, Lauren Sachs, who's our USAID mission director, for joining us this morning. Uh, obviously, USAID and the US government have played an important role in ushering peace to Colombia and will continue to play a role uh, moving forward in, in making sure that that peace sticks. Um, with that, I want to invite um, Jesus Abad Colorado up to show us some of his beautiful photographs and meaningful photographs. I should say beautiful is probably the wrong descriptor, um, but it's a fitting introduction to the conversation of how we uh, transform Colombia into a nation of peace. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to have all of you here, and it's really a pleasure to um, be relaunching the Colombia Peace Forum uh, with all of you this morning. Thank you. grateful to all of you for being here with us this morning. I am a journalist and a photographer. I am the son of a family that was displaced and arrived in Medellin in the year 1960, and I lost my grandparents, my uncles cousins throughout this armed conflict that has affected Colombia. I'm not a political analyst, but I would like to talk to you from my heart. When I learned how to show you the history of my country through images, I learned to write for the Colombians' background through terror from fear of words, 
I have a lot of images in my head, but at the time, those images have become a yell, a scream from my heart. And in this way that I express myself, I look to perhaps let people know what is the story that our communities have lived through. If I'm a son or a grandchild of grandparents that have been assassinated, of uncles and aunts or cousins that were kidnapped or disappeared, my heart obviously beats at the path of these victims and not to those that caused them what they suffered. I'm going to ask if you could lower the lights so you could see the images in a better way. I'd like to tell the story, a particular story. And when I say a story in particular is how we should get to know the history of just one town during this war. It's very difficult to understand that a country such as ours, not with 50 years of war, that the war began before the FARC was born. The war began before ELN or the paramilitary came into being. I'm telling you that I lost my grandparents, and it was back in the 1960s because they were of the Liberal Party in a conservative region of the country. And I can tell you this so that you perhaps would have more clarity and understanding. I could come here and have a t-shirt or a shirt, and I could go to some manifestation, and in the front of the t-shirt it could say something like the, the face of one of my cousins who disappeared through the Colombian military forces. And what was his sin? Basically, that he was a peasant and that he lived in a zone where the guerrillas lived. My cousin with an uncle were detained by the military through the Magdalena Medio in Cimitarra, Santander del Sur. My uncle was given his freedom, but they threatened that they were going to throw them out of a helicopter while they were taking them back to their battalion. My cousin, Abelardo, at the battalion, was assassinated. He had three children who were left fatherless. Abelardo Galeán Colorado. But on the back of that shirt, I could put another image and present Leon Correa Lopez, and those last names are Colorado Lopez. My name is Jesus Abad. Leon Urrea was kidnapped also by the FARC guerrilla. We paid part of the kidnapping. He was not a gentleman with a lot of money. He had two cars. Basically, he was just taking platano and corn to the, from the state of Meta to Bogota. And he would go to the market there to sell his products. He was kidnapped. We paid part of the ransom, but since there were no resources to pay, he was assassinated while he was in, capt in capture, but his body was never delivered to, to us. So what I'm talking to you now, I'm talking about my grandparent, my grandfather, my grandmother. I'm talking about my uncle and two of my first cousins. And I could go on. But what goes inside me, what in my mind exists, has made us hate. They taught us to hate, but they never taught us about vengeance, because I am the son of peasants. But they are individuals with ethics that are decent, that respect life, and that carry on in solidarity. So when I talk to you about the issues that have occurred during the war in Colombia, I can mention to you, there is the picture of Bojaya. 
How long does it take to get to Bojaya, let's say from the city of Medellin? 30 minutes, if you're in a small plane. If it weren't a jet, you'd get there in eight minutes. But in one of these little planes, 30 minutes from Medellin, where there's no communications, no roads, because people basically just use the river or the jungles, you see some of the worst violence in Colombia from 2002. Let me even go further back, 1996. Between 96 and 97, we saw counterinsurgent operations take place where members of the military, hand in hand with the paramilitary, went there to supposedly get the guerrilla and take them out of this area. But there was so much displacements and murders and murders that we saw in that town. And I'm speaking very clearly about the relationship that the army had with the paramilitary in many areas in Colombia, because that's something I'm not going to cover over as a journalist. I'm not a globist. I don't belong to any political party. I'm just a journalist. But as a journalist, I have to tell you as clearly as I can that many years, for many years, there were tragedies that occurred by armed groups that were illegal. And you can call them whatever you like, guerrillas, or you could call them paramilitary. But I can say that it, it's such a shame that in my country, many of the violent acts were done by military and paramilitary, and I'm a witness of those events. And when I have made the testimony, when I've been a witness of all these events, I have to give you the testimony of the truth and leave these images as a memory of what occurred. In these images, for example, you can say, you see that some 96 people that lived here were living through tragedy, through tragic times in the area of Chocó or Antioquia. Six years later, the paramilitary, with the disputes they were having with the FARC guerrillas, arrived at Bojayan. I shouldn't get away from the mic so I can keep talking to you. But on the right-hand side, you're seeing Antioquia. On the left is the area called Choco. And in the lower section is the town called Bojayan. On May 2, 2002, the combat between the guerrilla and the paramilitary occurred. They threw a bomb. The FARC actually dropped a bomb that fell inside the church. I was the first journalist that arrived in this town. And I, as I said to you, it was 30 minutes from Medellin. But it, I got there three days after the tragic bombing. I couldn't go on an airplane because it was combat that was being carried out for approximately a week at that time. But on the third day, I arrived at the city. As a journalist, I would take perhaps the route that was farthest away. I went up to the capital of Choco, which is Quimdo. And then I went down through the river. But all of the journalists could have come down on the river. Why was I the first one to be able to do it? Be because the church and the missionary groups know the type of work that I do. And they knew that I not, wasn't there to do a show. My idea was not to take images that were sensationalist, that for many years I had gone to many areas to follow the issues that happened, those that lost their lives. So I went down with the people from the church. I can tell you that I saw dead people being buried. Twelve of our Afro-descendants were the ones that were supposed to bring out those bodies. They had white gloves on to help bring the bodies out. Yes. I'm not taking pictures of uh, feet and hands in the uh, foreground. Uh, many uh, children were killed in this church. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, 
I apologize. So I saw the people who were killed in this church being uh, buried. Twelve men in white gloves uh, with their mouths covered uh, were the ones who buried these victims. Uh, in this canoe or this boat, you see the bodies of the victims uh, going down the river. I saw the faces of a multicultural uh, and multi-ethnic country, an Afro-descendant country, a uh, mixed uh, indigenous uh, group uh, of people, a uh, classist and racist country because it's the black people who live under the worst conditions in Colombia and the same can be said of the indigenous communities. But uh, it's even worse for them when war arrives. Now, these people would be uh, perfectly happy if they were just left alone uh, in on the riverside, but the armed forces arrived there, or sometimes uh, development arrives in the form of mining or the cutting down of the forests that destroys the quality of their waters and their mountains and uh, does away with their hope. These photographs were taken during those days that I was at that community, and the people would tell me, please, don't leave us because someone has to stay here to tell our story. And this can't just be an oral uh, account. There have to be images, such as many of the images we see here and in many countries that talk about what this tragedy perpetrated against humanity has been. These tragedies aren't the most important part of uh, what the rest of the country wants to hear. This might be only a half hour away from the city, but these are uh, forgotten, forlorn regions. If it happens there, well, it's because that's uh, where the black people live or where the indigenous people live. But it's when the tragedy isn't happening in the heart of the main cities, such as Medellin or Bogota or other big cities in Colombia, well, uh, people don't really uh, care. Six d days after what happened in the church, that tragedy, the army arrived and people fled and the people couldn't even uh, mourn their uh, dead loved ones. Uh, it took a month for them to be able to do so. Now, I didn't see anyone crying. I didn't see anyone you know, with tears in their eyes. There wasn't time for them to cry or to mourn. A month later, I bore witness to a ritual that the Afro-descendant communities engage in. Uh, alabados uh, is a type of uh, mournful uh, plaintive song uh, that they uh, sing to uh, mourn their dead, but they couldn't uh, engage in this ritual. And the fourth month, in September, that's when people were able to come back to their towns and the neighboring towns uh, greeted them uh, with uh, love uh, and with a sign of resistance to see that the people were coming back to their uh, homeland with uh, white flags that are indicative of peace and respect, uh, honor, humanity, and people greeted uh, the inhabitants of this uh, town that were returning. And among the people, you have Eugenio Palacio with his uh, newborn daughter. Uh, they were displaced during that time period. And uh, while displaced, Patricia, his daughter, was born. Uh, Chevere uh, was uh, another boy that came on this bark, uh, boat, rather, uh, 12 hours of navigation uh, back to Bojoya. They came back with their dogs. Dogs are important for the peasants, such as uh, their uh, chickens and their aromatic plants and their trees, all of which are important to them. In the same place uh, where they uh, 
saw their dead ones, uh, they engaged in a ritual using uh, candles, and this is in Choco, which is a department, as many others in Colombia, uh, that were beset uh, by this strife. Now, this is a, a map of Choco, and uh, this wasn't uh, only in memory of the 79 victims that died in the church, but the hundreds of people that uh, were also thrown into the river for years in which the armed groups were uh, fighting for the territory and where uh, the people who died in this strife were the peasants themselves. And uh, in that church, they danced that night. I saw them dancing and I saw them celebrate life. Days later, people were taken out of this common grave and taken to a cemetery where they were identified with numbers. And so they uh, created this uh, mantle uh, with the names of their of the victims. And uh, what we saw was emergence of nature where this tragedy had happened. Nature is wise and where people cause pain. You see uh, there uh, reemerges life in the form of uh, plants. And Arto Sabato, in one of his last books, perhaps the last book uh, entitled The Res uh, Resistance, said that uh, th it was sufficient for there to be uh, light coming through a crack uh, for life to emerge anew. And that's what happened here. Uh, life uh, reemerged uh, through the light uh, here in this window. It's not just uh, nature uh, reborn, but the Choco uh, people, the indigenous people, and the other peoples of my country who aren't the ones uh, that occupy the central uh, powers of the government. These are the people who live on the margins, the periphery. What you see here, I can't uh, broaden this picture to show you step by step. This is a mural that in January of uh, 20. 13, uh, when the boys and girls went back to their classes in the municipality of Bocoya, there was a teacher with a social worker of the National University uh, that was with them. And so they created this mural that speaks of the people uh, before the war and then in the midst of the war, the people who escaped in their boats down the river with their white flags, uh, such as the pictures I took that you saw, and ultimately they see the sun. That sun represents their hope. But the most beautiful thing here is what it says on the mural. It says that this mural gathers uh, and reflects the feeling and the words of the boys and girls who uh, call uh, into question the war, the pain, and the abandonment that it causes. And they remind us of the responsibility that uh, not forgetting means. I am what others could not become. And that's why we don't forget the fourth and fifth uh, grade of the urban school uh, of the municipality of Wokaya. These photos, I'll tell you what they are of. This is Apipi, which is a, a region of Pocoya, a small uh, reg uh, city of Pocoya. Now, you see in the background a home. This is a book that I published two years ago. And I would like to offer special thanks here from the bottom of my heart to, to the U.S. Uh, Agency of Cooperation because uh, they uh, supported the publication of some of these books. And uh, this book is out of publication, out of circulation. You can't get it uh, anymore. And that's why I'm telling you we need to publish more. This tells the stories uh, of our country. now. You see on the front of this book, on the cover, uh, Clidio, who's holding a white flag. 
Now I'm going to show you why Clirio is going down the river with uh, uh, three uh, missionaries and uh, a few other people and a woman who died uh, in uh, a fight five uh, days after the tragedy in the church because the war continued because war in my country I must say this well there's no longer war with the FARC there are some dissidents of the FARC that continue but in my country what is in the news is corruption, but not the fact that the cities are being taken. No one's talking in my country like they did 10 or 15 or 20 years ago of uh, the hundreds of abducted people of the cities destroyed, of soldiers who are ambushed and killed, and of warriors who are also Colombians uh, who are killed in uh, air raids. Now. The important thing I say here is that we all need to talk about Tomaco, where seven people were killed, because there's a serious problem that's taking place in Tomaco and those other areas in which you see uh, many people who are engaged in uh, drug trafficking, but also peasants who need development, not just the army, not just uh, uh, outlaw, uh, outlaw armed uh, groups. There are peasants who need to uh, produce their uh, product and people who are willing to buy their uh, products. But in regions uh, such as the Choco region, their product doesn't get to Bogota, their yuca. Uh, it is more profitable uh, to uh, grow illicit crops, which is what the peasants oftentimes turn to uh, as a means of survival in these far-flung areas. I don't want to justify this. I just want you to know that, well, it's a good thing that uh, what we hear in the news is uh, about corruption, because if there uh, were more instances uh, of the guerrilla uh, taking uh, over towns, so that's what would be in the headlines of the newspapers. Now, if uh, bullets uh, stop flying, well, now the journalists need to focus on the most serious problem that Colombia faces now, which is for us to understand that uh, people who uh, make a lot of noise with their firearms, that's just the result of a country that's very corrupt, in which oftentimes the leaders of the different uh, traditional political parties are uh, getting rich at the expense of the uh, public coffers, which is uh, belongs to the whole country. Whether it's a liberal party or the uh, radical change or conservative party or the uh, democratic uh, center uh, party or polo party, it doesn't matter what the stripe is. What we have to say is that what Colombia actually needs, which is ethics and uh, education and a better sense of humanity. And oftentimes, the peasants, the men and women of the countryside, such as my parents, are more ethical and decent than many of the people who are at the helm governing Colombia, the ones who have led Colombia. And to be a decent person, you don't have to go to a university. You just have to be uh, properly brought up. Education that, that you start uh, getting at home or in school. Let's go to Jesus Ava's uh, presentation, please. That's the PowerPoint presentation. I didn't take this picture. This photo is a part of the Book of Violence uh, uh, published in 63-64. The FARC hadn't even uh, started yet. This is a picture from a book that, when it was published, uh, Guzman Campos, Monsignor Guzman Campos uh, 
and the father of sociology in Colombia and a lawyer, Eduardo Mania Mendoza, Umania Luna, the father of a lawyer who was a human rights defender known as uh, Eduardo Umania Mendoza, who was killed in 1998. This book about violence in Colombia isn't a book that we are uh, shown or uh, taught about in Colombia. Very few people know about this book, but it talks about the tragedy of more than 300,000 uh, dead. And it uh, held up uh, who the responsible parties of the tragedy were, as well as those responsible for this uh, tragedy were not the police uh, or the birds or the uh, low class people, uh, but the political leaders, rather that uh, were exacerbating uh, and stirring up uh, hatred to get people to kill each other, to get uh, to pit one brother against another. Now this picture is the um, Peasant Christ, as it's called, and that's how my uncle died in August 17th of 1960. These are my grandparents, Jose Maria, and Maria Dolores. My grandmother uh, died four months after her husband uh, was uh, killed next to her bed and outside of her house. Uh, her youngest uh, son was killed and tied to a post. That's why she died of uh, pain, uh, a broken heart. And these are crimes and consequences that sometimes we don't even talk about when talking about war. This person that you see uh, next to this woman and this little girl, this is a special girl, my sister, uh, not my uh, biological sister, but we were raised together. So you see my mother, my father, and uh, this um, older sister of mine. Uh, it was uh, June 22nd of this year that my father died uh, while I was working in the field in Colombia in a um, uh, area in which the uh, FARC uh, guerrillas uh, were concentrated. How many years has this war in Colombia lasted? And the hands of the women tell that story. But their, uh, the faces of their grandsons and granddaughters also speak of this is in Antioquia in, in July of 2001, where I took this picture. And while I'm taking this picture, she is uh, seeing the bodies of peasants who have been murdered by paramilitary uh, groups uh, pass by. And this was July of 2001 when I took this picture. And she's telling me, 50 years ago, she said, I. Uh, saw this tragedy for the very first time. I had to run away from my town with my family. We uh, lost our um, crop of beans and corn. And now I'm uh, going through this once again with my children and my grandchildren. And I uh, wonder if uh, this little girl who is looking at you here up on the screen, uh, looking at what's happening in her country, is she uh, years hence going to have to go through this tragedy again? Or will we be able to stop this war once and for all, as this government or administration has tried to do? When I speak of this administration, the one that we currently have, I back the peace process wholeheartedly because I know what war means, because I've seen women uh, marching against war. This picture, which is uh, on the cover of um, Basta Ya book. Uh, I worked on this uh, commission and this uh, group of uh, memory, and that's where I met Jenny from the Institute of Peace, who uh, supported the work done by this uh, group, which was uh, preserving the memory. And this woman with a yellow flower in her hands, because in our country, we've never lost hope. There are people and there are prophets of war. There are prophets uh, who foresee tragedy. But if we were to ask the peasants who uh, are the ones who have lost the most in the war, the industrial sector or industrial leaders or the leaders of the country, no. The ones who have lost the most in Colombia 
are the families of the uh, peasants because they're the ones uh, whose children work in the guerrilla groups, in the army, in the paramilitary groups. The, it's their children who fight in these uh, battles. They were the ones who were the victims of these massacres, massacres uh, committed by the paramilitary groups and oftentimes in uh, association with the army massacres and a, a smaller scale the statistics that talk about this as well that were also committed by the guerrilla groups but the peasants are also the ones that whose lands are now uh, in the hands of the mafia of the corrupt uh, powers people who uh, have uh, taken over the land of those who were displaced from their lands. Peace isn't for people from Bogota to live well or in Cali or Medellin, because for many years now in these major cities, people don't really uh, have uh, first-hand contact with the war, with firearms. It's the peasants who have been hardest hit. And these are the ones who, for so many years, have been waiting for peace to arrive. This country that's uh, rich in uh, butterflies, birds, rivers, mountains, uh, what is left of the mountains, of the forests, rather, of the rivers, because uh, that is also another tragedy. This is the violence uh, that is being perpetrated against nature. I've seen the uh, butterflies uh, landing on the weapons uh, of the fighters. I've also seen uh, the destruction of the rivers by oil spills. And I ask, when are we going to stop this war? With the most uh, or the largest uh, armed group, well, that strife has already been brought to an end. But there is still the ELN guerrilla group and other groups that still uh, persist in their fight. But the nature in Colombia has also suffered. You can see the um, trees pockmarked with bullets and the forests destroyed and the anti-personnel mines uh, that sometimes were um, strewn uh, close to schools. 20 years, that is October 31st, 20 years ago. Today, 20 years ago, I was going to eat Tuango. I was the first journalist to go there to chronicle a tragedy in which the paramilitary groups for five days tortured and murdered uh, people from this town and a friend, a very close friend of mine, a human rights defender of the Conservative Party, the non-communist Conservative Party, who was a lawyer in my city in uh, Jaramillo, reported the, or turned in the uh, paramilitary groups uh, for uh, working with the army in perpetrating this crime and the governor at that time in 1997 said that that human rights defender, just as uh, the journalists, uh, he said, he said that the human rights de defender, that this is a crime, said the governor, that the uh, army hadn't arrived at. But over time, it became evident in the uh, Inter-American uh, Human Rights Court uh, it was shown that the army was complicit in what happened here, but four months after my friend was killed in the city of Medellin, his office was uh, right uh, on the opposite uh, side of the street of the Tribunal of Justice. And what did they do to him as a symbol before killing him? They uh, put tape over his mouth so he wouldn't keep talking because he was the one, said the governor then and uh, now, uh, was uh, harming the institutions of the country. And that's what oftentimes happens to uh, journalists. Uh, now, this was 1997 in the city, a day just like today. I was walking through the mountains to arrive at this town and to be able to tell the story of what had uh, happened in this town to my country. Now, the, you can see the nature is destroyed here um, uh, so that um, coca leaf can be uh, planted. Our rivers 
became uh, common graves, mass graves, and in many places of our country, or in some places, to not uh, exaggerate. I don't like to exaggerate, but what I saw yesterday in the Holocaust Museum, the uh, crematories that also happened in Colombia in the northern Santander uh, region, and uh, here you see a uh, oven or crematory. Now, peasants were uh, tortured, uh, tied to this tree before they were uh, sent to the uh, ovens where they were uh, cremated. And you can see the signs uh, on the tree of what happened, where the peasants were tied. The mark is still uh, on the bark of the tree. And here you have one of the um, crematories or ovens. And close to that tree where the peasants were tied, you see a shoe like the shoes I saw yesterday in the museum to the Holocaust. This shoe takes on life because nature is growing on the articles of clothing or the shoes left by the peasants at the foot of the tree where they were tied and close to the oven where they were cremated. Animals were also branded Women were branded. This picture was taken in 2002. This was a young girl of 17 years that was raped by four or five paramilitary uh, men. And it took me three years to publish this picture because I didn't want to uh, make a display, a spectacle of this. Now, Amnesty International 2005 uh, came to talk about sexual violence against women, especially in Colombia, in a country in which oftentimes the country didn't want to see what was happening there. And so you can see that uh, the guerrilla uh, forces left graffiti on the walls of the buildings, uh, Park, Yelin, and uh, also uh, as uh, uh, bearing witness of, of their groups sponsored by the state. Uh, these were schools for the paramilitary uh, operatives. Now, in Colombia, many attacks uh, were perpetrated uh, destroying entire towns, air strikes of the Air Force in uh, peasant areas, entire forests that were destroyed by oil that uh, spilled and it continues to spill. And that's another reason we have to stop this war. Let's go to Granada, image 83, please. I want to talk about Granada in Antioquia. This is a municipality that in 2000 uh, underwent uh, two different uh, armed uh, attacks. In November, the paramilitary groups killed 19 peasants. They didn't, uh, the, this was uh, November 3rd of 2000 in which this happened. 19 peasants were murdered. Little girls, little girls who were going to the school in that territory, at least they went there because nowadays, the schools are quiet, and there were attacks that were occurring. People began to flee. They were being displaced by the violence they were seeing. The FARC guerrilla accused the police of having been accomplices of the attacks by the paramilitary. So in December, on the 16th, 17th, they destroyed the police barracks in the area. And at the same time, 258 homes in the area, 23 people died. 18 were civilians, five were police officers. I went down there with some of my friends from human rights organizations from Medellin. And we went to go to be together with the people. And the people marched with us in Granada. The flag that you see for the peace territory, something you're going to see in, in the 
leftovers that we would see of the town and the mountains and the, what was left of the church. That very same day, when I went there, and this was a day after the guerrilla attack, on 7th of December, people in Colombia light candles. They begin to celebrate Christmas because they couldn't light these candles on the 9th of December, two days later. People here, you can see, are lighting the candles during the day to celebrate life. They gathered at the park so they could hold hands, so they could say, this area is for peace, and they're not going to bend our wills, and it's not for the military or the guerrilleros or the guerrilla. But sadly, in Granada, Granada, we saw that the public forces were in complicit agreement with the paramilitaries, and that's what the peasants in Granada tell their story. This woman here who's crying, she's looking at a woman who's about to be married. You can see the peace territory flag that I mentioned before is there on the ground and it's at the entrance, the atrium to the church. And at the back, you can see the Red Cross. This is Beatriz Garcia, who's going with Oscar Giraldo in the middle of a war to be married. People in town murmured, is she crazy? They didn't point out the man. They pointed out the bride. Is she crazy? She's going to be married when we're looking for the dead people that are here in the midst of all this Madness? How could she think about this? And Beatriz getting married in the midst of the strategy said to me as a photographer, and a, please don't take pictures of me. Fortunately, these images are a testimony. That, that picture was taken 17 years ago, and you can see what it says there in the sign going into the church. That sign was also the ones that marched. They carried it. The people that went to become part of the, the town, war, everyone loses. All of us should help to construct a peace process. In Granada, people held hands to reconstruct their town. Many of them took out their, their pigs, their horses. They sold them because with 22,000 inhabitants, it dropped to 5,000. And those that stayed in that town held hands to commit actions that were in tribute to life. And the mayors from Antioquia, together with the government at that time, October 14th of 2001, 10 months after the tragedy, the governor, Guillermo Gaviria Correa, organized the Marcha del Ladrillo. It's a reconstruction of Granada. Guillermo Gaviria is the husband of one of my Colombian colleagues who is going to be here. And she directed a unit victim of victims, Yolanda Pinto. But Guillermo is part of the ones here marching. And it's this woman here dressed in white. You can see that she's going to be married as well. And here a child dressed with her baptismal gown. In the midst of about 1,000, 1,500 people, each one carrying a brick. So they, they reconstruct the city of Granada. This picture should be a symbol today in my country, a country that today is divided supposedly between the friends of peace and people that want to destroy the process and want to tear it apart. And I ask myself, everyone in Colombia, men and women, rich and poor, businessmen, professors, peasants, and the people in the cities, we should, shouldn't we each be laying a brick? Shouldn't we do that when we have to recognize that many of the governments are supporting the peace process. But I don't think that any other government should come in to stand up for the peace in Colombia. But I know that many areas in the territory and many people, the cooperation here from the agencies here in the United States is in a lot of places in Colombia trying to work on peace. 
while many people are wanting to basically back the war. So very sadly, I have to say that the phenomena that we today we're calling the post-truth is causing a lot of harm in our country, not only in Colombia, but in many other places in the rest of the world. But in my country, in my own country, instead of celebrating peace, and instead of putting down that one brick, each one at a time, many people are opposed and they're trying to block the process. Why Bohaja, that town that I showed you earlier, they voted 96% Yes. In a city like where I live in Medellin, and a state like Antioquia, 400,000 votes voted no. And I'm embarrassed by that, because I understand that this negative leadership that has basically sown fear with Contra Chavismo, they're telling people that tomorrow the FARC is going to be in control, as if we were going to vote for them. Whoever wants to vote for them, obviously, they'll be free to do so. But throughout the country, even though there's so much corruption, there's a lot of decent people in Colombia. I know decent people from different parties. But I would have to say to them that they haven't worked for Colombia. They haven't put their heart and soul into the heart and soul of the people. They haven't known how to walk in the shoes of these victims in Granada while they were trying to reconstruct the city, there was even more tragedy. Here, you're seeing the reconstruction of the town, and you see the coffins coming by. And they finish reconstructing it, and I go back to see this peace banner float, and people continue planting where they recover the bodies of the dead. People, the people that came to Granada and reset it, had reconciliation in this, and had marches for reconciliation years ago. But it's sad to say that the vote was no. And many of these towns in Antioquia voted no. Because not just the politicians came there to campaign in order to destroy the process, but many of the sectors of the Colombian Catholic Church, Protestant churches, dedicated themselves to sow terror in the population, so they would vote no. That causes me to be very sad. If those leaders in our country would only see Colombia from a plane or from a building, if they dedicated themselves to walking in the path of the peasants, if they went to the mountains of my country, if they went across the rivers, if we went horseback, then maybe, for sure, they would understand that peace is the most important and urgent need for our country. Beatriz Garcia and Oscar Giraldo, the couple that I showed you before in that church when they got married in the year 2005, I met them again, and I took these pictures. To understand that that woman who was married back then in the midst of the war could show that love was stronger than violence. But we're very sad, very embarrassed to talk about love and to say that we should be loving and we don't want to talk about being human because sometimes we pay much more attention to those who talk with belligerence and with a hard voice. In Colombia, there is a saying, berraco. It's a word like a real macho man, someone who's very strong. And that's what we want to hear sometimes. We want to talk about the father that's violent, that can he has his ruana on and his poncho, and he has to put things in order. But they don't teach us that it's love, that it's education, that it's decency that is going to make us go forward. Last year, a year before the plebiscite, I went to look for Beatriz and Oscar again. That couple from Granada that were married in the midst of that tragedy, they have about a half an acre of land. And on, on that half acre, they have one cow. Beatriz works out in the field with her husband, Oscar. They actually make panela, or the raw sugar from sugarcane, and Beatriz voted yes 
for the peace process. Because she doesn't want this war to be repeated. I don't want to go on, but I even learned the names of the animals on the farm. Because a farmer that has 1,500 head of cattle, for example, could care less. He only cares about what he makes and how much money he can make. But a couple, like Beatriz and Oscar, they care for each one of their animals. The cow is named Bolita, so that she could have a calf, that she could give them milk, so they could make some cheese, so they could feed their children. They have a small crop area. They have a few chickens, three dogs, Coqui Lupe, and a scooby -Doo. They have two geese, Evelio and Imelda, and a rooster. They wanted to baptize them, as they said to me. They wanted to call them Chucho, like my name. Two months ago, I went back again to bring them up a copy of that picture that I just showed you. They not only have the picture of, that I took of their wedding day, but they also have this picture. We're going to go back to the previous presentation so I can reach a close to my remarks today. I work with the victims. I've met most of the commanders in my country, from the ELN, from the FARC, from the Army, the political leaders. But in my pictures, I like to talk about the victims of Colombia and who they've been. That's why when I'm showing you these images, I'd like to talk about those that were the losers, those that we have to return their hopes in life. Let's go to Jesus Abad and go to picture 76. I can talk about what do people that are being displaced in the midst of a war, what do they carry with them? When I talked about Granada, I mentioned Bojaya to you. I can tell you that in those towns, I like to tell stories of each one of the events that I'm documenting, because the story of a pueblo should have names, should have last names. We should say that these peasants are the ones that displaced in the year 97 from Duitango, that this child is from San Jose de Apado, from a massacre committed in 2005 by the army. In Iparas, where the captain, Guillermo Armando Gordillo, two years later confessed how they had planned the action in which eight peasants were killed in the mountains. And that was a crime that was initially said to be part of the FARC. The government, the prosecutor's office, said it was the FARC. If I hadn't been there to document that event, if the people hadn't listened to the peasants, to a father like Javier Giraldo, an ex-mayor like Gloria Cuartas, that crime would have been a part of the impunity that was carried out. But fortunately, I was there to gather testimony and to be able to show what happened. And as the years went by, so that justice could finally be sought. These images, they talk about men that also cry because of the war. I've seen men cry. But you can also see the strength and the courage of the women of my country, because they are courageous. And now, there are so many friends here of the NGOs. I want to recognize all of the international agencies that have come and walked with us. I've seen the Red Cross. I've seen PBI. I've seen people walking hand in hand with the communities, putting their lives at risk to protect the lives of peasants in Colombia, like in San Jose. But that pain, that's the pain we have to stop. So the children won't be crying from the years of five, seven, eight, nine years of age because they have to flee because of war. I don't have anyone pose. I'm a graphic photographer. 
but I've seen people flee from so many areas. In the northern area, Cienega Grande, Nueva Venecia, 40 fishermen that were assassinated by our military, and the people flee. And how do they flee in my country? You can see here in boats, on horseback, and on the horseback, they carry their chickens, they carry their children. Unfortunately, if the screen were even bigger, you could actually count that she has four chickens. And one of them literally drowned in the river of San Lucas. And this is just as easy and simple reflection, isn't it? For Colombia, for anywhere in the world, how much is, is war worth? How much is invested in a war? Any camp that is set for those that it displays with cents, just a few cents, you could dress a child. In this case, a little girl. She's carrying a toothbrush with her. How much is war worth? How much is, is the gun, the grenade launcher, the helicopters, the uniforms? That's when you start to understand that war is also a business, a business for those that manufacture those products, that that war causes individuals displaced with families that sometimes even carry their refrigerators on their back. And that peasant, his name is Misael, and he's running away with Karina, and Karina is, has her feet up in the air. And that man who's carrying the refrigerator is the same man who takes the pigs out, and the pig is there, and he is crying that the father is hiding. Each one of these pictures should be just like that, just to make us stop and look and think, why is he fleeing? What happened? What caused this war? Who are responsible for it? Because we have to bring peace back to the land. I've seen the peasants. I've seen them leave with Christ in their hand, running with their dogs, their pigs, their monkeys, their chickens. This particular picture is Mapiripan in the Meta area of Colombia. There's 23 peasants assassinated there. People have eight days to leave the town because they're accomplices of the guerrilla. They can only flee with one suitcase in a plane that's used for cargo. And a little girl goes up to the man from the Red Cross and he says, can I take my chicken in my arms with me? They can only bring one bag, and the cruise, Red Cross International Cruise gentleman asks her, why do you want to bring this chicken with you? It's a gift from, that was given to me for my birthday, and he said, take it. And I'm telling you this story, because many people would say, you're lying. What you're trying to do is sensitize us, make us aware about the effects of a war. But I can tell you that if you doubt me, and people sometimes doubt me, there's the symbol of the Red Cross and the plane and the people, and there at the bottom left, after the little child that you see, you can see the little girl holding her chicken and her mom. And in front, there's a man that has a parrot. What is war? It is a tragedy for everyone involved but not everyone has lived through it. And we have to stop war. That's why I'm saying I don't care if peace had been carried out by X, Y, or Z today, whomever. Today it's Mr. Santos. The fact that he works for the peace process, any president from any place is going to have me beside him because I know what war does, because my family lived through it. But I wasn't taught to just look at vengeance. I wasn't taught. I was not taught that the law of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, no, I was taught to put myself in the shoes of someone else, to say, I don't want to see these pictures. In my country today, there is too much violence in areas of Colombia. In many others, we are seeing the post-conflict. 
we have to support the post-conflict because I don't want to see this again. I don't want to see people that are in warehouses with the pain of displacement, of having lost their land, having left their crops piled in these football fields trying to cook a meal because their home is back in the mountains. I've seen the peasants of my country so many times that these pictures I'm showing you talk about that displacement. These are almost biblical images. This one was back in 2005 in San Jose de Apartado. People fleeing to the assassination of eight peasants. And amongst those eight, there were three little children, 20 months, five years old and 11 year old. And it's, it was a horror massacred by the, the army. We don't want to see except the criminality of the FARC. That's all we want to see in my country. But there are many more criminals in my country. But we just want to put the bias on one of them, the p political parties and many leaders in Colombia wash their hands. And what I'm saying is those of you that have stolen the coffers of Colombia, didn't they have responsibility in the war as well? It's so much easier to point at someone that has a weapon. But I know, and I've met a lot of the combatants, children of assassinated peasants that went into the war for vengeance. And I've seen them in all of the areas that I visited. We must stop the war. It can't be that one brother should kill his brother. Image 44, please. En ese mismo, en el mismo. En el año 92. In 92, there are two pictures from Cielos Estrellados. I'm not sure how you're going to see it because there's so much light in the room. But back in 92, <clears throat> when I was a journalist and studying at the university, I saw the first act of violence. In my memory is the war of my family. I'm a journalist. I went to a town where they had seen tragedy outside of a school. There was a guerrilla attack where 14 military men were killed. And this is where they were killed, the smell, the pain. I looked into one of the classrooms. And what was the, the last one before this event? Which was the last class between Daveta and Mutata in the Via Urava? The last class had been a religion class. And you can see on the blackboard the story of Cain and Abel, a brother that had killed his brother. Many times. I could say that I don't know who Cain or Abel is, because for me, the soldiers are Colombian brothers. The police are my brothers in Colombia. The guerrillas as well. They're children of Colombia, and for, consequently, they're my brothers as well. I'm part of the party of the mothers, as one of my Colombian friends, Fabiola La Linda, says. Her son disappeared. The Colombian army took him in 84, and Fabiola Lalinde was dedicated then her life to not follow those that had disappeared by the, the army and the guerrilla and those that are kidnapped. Fabiola, who is right now older and she's forgetting, has said to me that I'm her first ally in the party of the mothers. If I look at the clothes of the police officers, of those that died, or the boots of the soldiers, of the clothing of the fishermen assassinated by the paramilitaries in so many areas of my country, I say that war has to stop. The best way 
to get Colombia moving forward, is for all of us to put that brick that I mentioned before for peace, to lay that brick. And so as not to continue this morning, I'd like to show you some faces. One on nine, the number, it says kill and God forgives. Colombia doesn't have a religious war. Colombia doesn't have a religious war. Mostly it is a Catholic evangelical country. And amongst all of the combatants, whether legal or illegal, I've seen the very same symbols of religion. But sometimes I've seen them where there's been tragedy and massacres. And I've seen signs like these. I could talk and make a whole presentation on graffiti during this war. I could do the same thing on those displaced, on children, on women. But I'm jumping ahead just to tell you that this is a picture of an exclamation that was done. And I could make a whole presentation on just this issue in Colombia. And in these events in my country, when you get people out of the burial place in the midst of the mountain, the very first thing that we see is usually a rosary, an image of a cross, a scapulary. And that's what I see sometimes on the chests of the combatants. To honor the memory of those who died, I'd have to tell you that this rosary was on the chest of a woman named Gloria Milena Aristizabal. That woman and her husband were murdered. I know Gloria Milena's mother, and I know her children. And two months ago, I spent time with them. But I don't have time today to show you those photographs and how people do survive and resist these events. But I wanted to show you these pictures of a country where absolutely every single one, paramilitary, soldiers, guerrilla fighters, all of them use the same Christian symbol, the child, scapularies. And when I know the face of those children, those boys and girls, for me, it's tears. Because if a child, 13, 14, 15 years old, belonging to an armed group, why? And what I would like to work on is so that there is education now. And that's what I claim to all of the people in Colombia. And I ask them, and I ask all of you strongly, that you have to understand that war is a tragedy for everyone. It doesn't matter if it's in the Middle East. It doesn't matter if the war comes here to the United States. It'll hurt me as well. It has to hurt me what happens in Africa and Mexico, as in Colombia. I don't know any war other than the one in Colombia. My heart would not resist another war. My heart tells me, and I tell you truly, that my life and my heart every day is more and more fragile with the pain of my country. And that's why I try to work to understand that war has to stop, that we can be a loving country, but that we cannot go back and carry these weapons to cause the tragedies that have occurred. You're seeing these pictures of a gorilla of the ELN, or a guerrillera from the FARC. Guerri guerrilleros also have families. They're not devils. Guerrilleros also have the right to live in peace. They've carried out a war for many years. Yes, they have. But there are people that silently that have also, politics have created it. And I think it's even harder today in Colombia. It's even harder today to disarm the spirit of many of those political leaders. 
than more so than these guerrilla fighters whom I've been working with. And I say war is a tragedy, and it continues making us ill. I don't understand how they could put a uniform on an animal. That's part of the sickness. And part of the sickness is using dogs in the midst of a war, which had been used in Colombia. But the, nobody believed the peasants. And they've used jaguars and alligators, but the uh, peasants didn't uh, believe now. This is a jaguar. Uh, they also had a lion. Different uh, combinations of uh, ways of uh, fighting. You've got the uh, uh, armies, you've got uh, the uh, illegal groups, and how people camouflage themselves uh, to blend in with the jungle. 2002 after the Olion operation. I could talk about Medellin, but uh, I wanted to show you a picture like this. This could be uh, D-Day in Normandy, uh, but this is Colombia. I wanted to show you some faces of victims of the disappeared people. Now, 171, please. Image 171. Uh, Evangelina. Evangelina, who told me one day, Chucho, please, take a picture of me with my son who uh, was abducted, disappeared. Carmen told me the same thing. I could uh, talk about many uh, places in my country uh, where the same thing happened in Medellin, Claudia, uh, in uh, Magdalena, a member of the, uh, of the uh, law enforcement also disappeared in the uh, Magdalena department. Uh, Here's another person uh, who was abducted and murdered in April of 2002, murdered in 2003 in a rescue attempt that uh, should never have been uh, attempted by the Army. But I bring these Im images here uh, today. These are images uh, that I show from many uh, regions of Colombia. What is it we want in Colombia? We want to die of old age. We want peace. These photos are of many years back, but uh, the images that we see are always images of war, not of uh, resistance of a governor, for example, that stood down the violent people and said, no more, no more, that's enough and the NGOs who for so many years have done this, but these are the images no one ever sees, and that's why these pictures bear witness uh, to this. And I want to conclude with these picture, pictures, and many, many of these uh, mobilizations, these uh, peasants who are coming back to their towns, you see that uh, with them are friends from NGOs, you've got a governor here, and people asking uh, in this um, banner, does anyone believe the solution is war? My country needs to build peace. And I would invite you, for each one of you, to put your hand on your heart and to understand that the commitment of a government, the commitment of a university or of human rights defense groups has to be uh, a commitment to the victims and to people who sign on to a peace agreement and to uh, start a new uh, path toward life. Be these are daughters and sons, and as long as I'm alive, I'm going to honor what my parents had taught me from the time I was a kid, to be, to express solidarity and to uh, walk in the shoes of others. Thank you very much. And I apologize if I went over 10 or 15 minutes uh, over my lot of time, but understand that uh, every story that I tell 
uh, of every uh, people uh, whose story I tell, I need to uh, cite their names because each one could tell. Uh, for, if I were to go on and talk about all the different stories, I could go on for weeks and months even. Thank you very much. We're going to have to stick uh, strictly to our time. Thank you very much and good morning. I want to tell you uh, that I'm uh, thrilled to be here with you today. It's an honor for me uh, to be at the Peace Institute of the United States. I would like to thank everyone who uh, made it possible for me to be here. Uh, all of the USAID um, folks who are here, I thank you, the entire uh, delegation, on behalf of my country. Thank you for supporting us. Without a doubt, 
Your support is invaluable for us uh, to carry out the work that we do on behalf of the victims of Colombia. I'm Yolanda Pinto. I'm uh, the widow of Gaviria, and I really uh, I'm surprised, uh, Chucho, when uh, you showed images of my husband, my late husband, and before going on, I would like to greet all the Colombians and my uh, companions, compatriots who are here with us today, the victims of Colombia who live here in the U.S., a, a fraternal uh, hug for all of you. I am a victim of the war in Colombia. My husband, uh, Guillermo Gaviria uh, Correa, uh, governor of the most important state or department in Colombia, was abducted by the FARC guerrilla group, after uh, which he was murdered unnecessarily uh, in a, a military rescue operation that should not have happened. It was uh, poorly planned and poorly executed. That same day, I learned that uh, my life could become hell, uh, or I could not let it become hell. I had to learn to forgive. And I can tell you here today that to forgive gave me peace. It made it possible for me to go on living almost happy, I can say, because I've been able to see my kids grow up and now my grandchildren. And today, I have the wonderful opportunity that our, that the president of our country, um, uh, Santos Calderon, uh, who has made this possible, uh, and it makes it possible for me to be in charge of the state-run organization that uh, is uh, assisting the victims of the armed conflict in Colombia to help them uh, uh, come back into society. And uh, I would say that the most important decision that we've made over the last six decades in Colombia has been to put an end to this conflict that has caused uh, so much pain, so much harm, that has uh, taken away from us the lives of so many Colombians, uh, among whom my husband, uh, who have been so valuable for this society, that would have played such an important role in the transformation process in Colombia had they lived. But I am here, full of faith and optimism and uh, trust and hope, uh, given the opportunity that uh, all Colombians now are presented with to finally have a country for everyone, in which everyone fits, everyone belongs, without any uh, uh, concern for uh, regard for a difference of color, of um, ideology. We all belong here. And um, Pope Francisco, in his recent visit in my country, said that among all Colombians, we together can build a country for everyone. And in this uh, undertaking, we are engaged now. And that is what I want to show you. The National uh, Unit for Victims was, uh, as uh, the coordinator of this pro program or panel has said, was uh, something that emerged before the Havana Accord. The victims were recognized before the signing of the first agreement with the guerrilla group, which uh, is the FARC, 1448 of 2011, recognized that in Colombia, the armed conflict had uh, left in its wake many victims, and that these uh, victims need, needed to have reparations paid to them by the Colombian state. This is a task that falls to the National Unit of Victims in Colombia. After six decades of strife, leading to thousands of deaths and uh, other uh, human rights violations and uh, violations of humanitarian uh, law, the government has finally uh, thoroughly uh, become committed to bring it into this conflict and to build peace and to pay reparations to victims. Victims are at the center of this process. 
of negotiations with the FARC, and we are at the center of the implementation of the peace accords. Now, the end of the armed conflict and um, satisfying the rights of victims is the best guarantee of non-repetition. We do have a very important task to carry out. USAID, the USAID rather, has always been there, uh, helping us, collaborating, uh, uh, staying abreast, uh, side by side with us in this task. The uh, land restitution and victim law uh, of uh, 2011, 1428, uh, passed by the National Congress and pushed through uh, by Juan Manuel Santos under his administration set forth a policy uh, to repair, pay reparations to victims, uh, this uh, in keeping with uh, the highest legal standards uh, anywhere in the world and a comparative uh, legal study together with uh, 49 other world uh, programs uh, for the purpose of reparations. Um, that is, the Harvard University did this comparative study and shows that ours is of uh, the highest uh, legal standards of all. Now, the policy uh, for paying reparations and uh, caring for victims of the armed conflict has four fundamental uh, rules. This, this uh, 1448 law for the mestizo uh, community, another for the indigenous population, and also uh, for the Afro-Colombian, as well as a decree of law 1434, one more uh, for the rural communities. A la fecha. Thus far, and by uh, the end of uh, 2017, we hope uh, these will be the uh, figures and uh, even higher by the end of the year. Eight billion Colombian pesos, 200, that is, uh, this is how much money has uh, gone uh, for reparations in Colombia. 2.6 billion dollars, 2.6 billion dollars, which uh, has been the overall amount uh, kicked in by the government for this policy during the uh, period between 2011 and uh, 2021. Currently, we have records or registered 8 million victims of the armed conflict. 8,500,000 victims uh, of the different types of uh, crimes for which they were victims. Six and a half million are uh, internally displaced peoples. 563 uh, collective reparations uh, for ethnic and non-ethnic groups. You can see what the distribution is up on the screen according to the different departments or states in our country. We also have a model for providing a uh, minimum subsistence that is under the first classification and characterization of uh, homes, uh, households, according to the different criteria that uh, is applied by the state uh, to ensure the effective enjoyment of uh, rights uh, associated with subsistence. And thirdly, the questions that are asked that make it possible for us to objectively understand that there is indeed a true enjoyment of the rights to uh, health, housing, and uh, proper uh, nourishment or sufficient uh, food. Now, this is the first humanitarian uh, agent uh, of the country that is uh, this program uh, is uh, the body that provides uh, assistance to victims and that uh, seeks out lasting solutions for the displaced population uh, within our country. We have invested from 2012 on in humanitarian assistance uh, uh, for victims of uh, forced displacement more than 3.9 1.6 billion dollars has been invested 
that's 4 billion Colombian pesos has been invested in offering assistance to internally displaced. Now, the collective reparations uh, system uh, brings about a political dialogue among the institutions of our country and uh, those uh, who are being having reparations paid for them to reinstill uh, trust in the state. And this is what ultimately will lead to reconciliation. This is for all of us in this recovery process and to make whole those people who uh, are a part of these collective uh, groups, subject of uh, this assistance, that is where we can truly uh, rebuild uh, the uh, mend, the social tissue uh, fabric that has been des destroyed, uh, torn asunder by this strife. So there's a collective reparation uh, program uh, for each one of these collective groups. We're talking about a host of uh, different actions for reparations purposes uh, given uh, the harm suffered by these different communities. These actions are called reparation measures, which consist of uh, certain uh, being made whole for damages uh, suffered, uh, community uh, rehab and uh, rebuilding uh, social fabric or uh, some type of compensation or operations paid uh, in monetary terms, economic uh, compensation. So in Colombia, we have offered economic uh, compensation to more than uh, 700,000 victims through uh, investments made by the Colombian state. We're talking about 5 billion pesos worth of investments added to what we have all already uh, invested in humanitarian assistance as well as collective reparations. It ultimately will reach at the end of this year, as I just uh, said, 9 billion Colombian pesos. Three billion US dollars invested in Colombia. This is the most important task that we have been carrying out. Lastly, I want to tell you that we are in full swing of implementation of the peace accords and the victims, again, are front and center in this implementation of these Peace Accords. The National Unit for Victims has been uh, following through and fulfilling the commitments, uh, including the participation of the victims themselves, uh, who are themselves enshrined in the Havana Agreement. We have engaged in a broad participatory process. More than 3,300 uh, victims were able to sit down with us during 33 different uh, working uh, meetings, and that gave, well, they, their opinions and their contributions were heard in these meetings to ensure that this policy is as best as it can be. This is a process that we are making progress in and better uh, fine-tuning and defining. We're also We've also set up a specific uh, table uh, for the uh, to put together the protocol and the path forward for victims to be able to take part in the development as well as in investigations uh, carried out by the special uh, jurisdiction or justice for peace. We, the victims ourselves, are uh, waiting uh, for this, and we are demanding. Uh, truth, that justice be done, that reparations be paid, and uh, that there be guarantees of non-repetition, which is what was uh, pledged by those who decided to put an end to the armed conflict. That's uh, what the National uh, Unit for the Victims is there for, to uh, ensure uh, that victims be allowed to uh, speak, that they be recognized, that justice uh, be uh, meted out within the framework of uh, traditional justice uh, in keeping with the Havana Peace Accords, because we are also demanding 
uh, to know the truth of what happened with all of those who have gone missing, who disappeared, everything that happened during this uh, armed strife in Colombia. This is, will be a true uh, rep rep uh, measure of reparations for the victims, that the truth be known, and that's precisely what the National Unit uh, for uh, Attention to the Victims is there for, uh, keeping them to their word in this process. Now, the challenges in the implementation of this final agreement uh, continue to be huge. Uh, offering assistance, uh, putting, standing up the different agencies that were created to implement uh, points one and five of the final uh, peace accord so that was signed on to with the FARC. I would like to conclude by saying that Colombia is hopeful that we can Uh, together with the international community that has helped us, uh, the international organizations that have been with us every step of the way, the international uh, agencies that cooperate with us, uh, chief among them uh, that from the U.S. that has played such a key role. What we hope together to do is to build peace, as Chucho himself said, the peace we all want, even though there are still those who are not capable of forgiving because their hatred keeps them from understanding the uh, virtue of having finally put an end to this war that in 53 years took 250,000 Colombians away from us that have left more than 8 million victims all told and more than 6.5 million displaced within our borders. I want to tell you that the statistics tell us that over the last two years, we put an end, finally, to a conflict only with the FARC guerrilla group. Four thousand Colombian lives were saved by virtue of ending that war, because in the uh, height of the conflict, at least that many people would have died had it continued. And as a victim, I can tell you that these 4,000 saved lives, I already feel repaired. Just one life saved in Colombia suffices for me to be whole again. And I can say that many victims in Colombia feel the same thing that I do. We need for you to stand by us, to support us, to stay with us in this process so that we can continue uh, moving forward that our president, Juan Manuel Santos Calderon, has initiated of, by making the decision to um, put an end to this conflict that will make it possible for us to build a different country for everyone. Of course, there are other um, participants in this violence. There's the uh, also the problem of drug trafficking and the bad karma that that brings us that we have to continue to combat. And the Colombian state is committed to continue fighting that scourge. But as Chucho said as well, there are, that gives rise, drug trafficking gives rise to other forms of violence uh, that we have uh, been dealing with for many years and that affects all of the Colombians. And uh, it makes us seem uh, in, uh, before the world as a violent country. But the truth is, we are a country that unfortunately, uh, where coca production has, for many Colombians, become a profitable, albeit illegal, business. It's a contradiction. It's profitable, but illegal. And this has caused for us many difficulties in those territories where the drug traffickers who live uh, from this have uh, set up shop 
and uh, taken ownership over those uh, parcels of land. But the government is doing its part of trying to eradicate, of uh, fighting uh, the uh, drug cultivation and on the political side uh, also doing their part to uh, pay reparations to the victims. Thank you very much for hearing me. First of all, I want to thank USIP for this invitation and USIP to give us this room and for all of uh, those that are here. It's a privilege for me to be able to share with Jesus and Director Pinto regarding the, the challenges for the construction of peace in Colombia. I'm going to tell you about some public policies that are having to do with construction or the peace construction. In the last 14 years, we've learned about our mistakes. It's part of an institutional evolution that began in the 90s. It's an ent entity that has been just technical, but they've understood the importance of give sustainability to public policies that actually goes for peace construction. It's a public policy that began back in the 90s unfortunately, between 90 and the demobilization of the paramilitaries lost a lot of the lessons learned. That since 2003, we are now bringing forward, we're understanding and analyzing, so we don't make the same mistakes again to not construct on what's constructed. Nowadays, we have an agency that I represent to reincorporate and normalize Colombian agency to reintegrate two different processes. First of all, reintegration of the ex-paramilitaries that demobilized collectively, and the promise of reintegration of the FARC members who demobilized individually. And actually, other than escape or divert, desertion, etc., and also ELN, and reincorporation also of the people that mobilized, demobilized from FARC during the peace process. To give you a context in Colombia, we have two different paths in what we know internationally as a DDR, and it's individual demobilization is when someone individually decides to get out of the armed group, and they go through the defense ministry, through the evaluating committee, to certify what the individual is part of the group. The minors go through the interest family group for their human rights in Colombia, and adults also begin the process of reintegration. And then there's a collective path, which we're experimenting on, when a group signs a peace agreement. And through the Office of the High Commissioner for Peace, they send us a list that we start to follow. In Colombia, since 2003, we've demobilized approximately 60,000 people who have voluntarily, 50,000 have gone into the integration process. Starting from the last few years, we have had more than 20,000 people that nowadays are citizens. We have, in process, about 20,000 or 18,000, to be more exact. So one of the lessons learned throughout the 14 years is that there's always people that are left along the way. And it's a decision that's voluntary in its nature. Therefore, we see that maybe about 10,000 people have not become a part of the process. But there's other people that are left along the way. And this is in the sense that this is not a process. It's a process of opportunities and their own will. 10 to 12,000 have been left along the line because it didn't follow the rules or the standards set up by the agency so that their process would be for reintegration. More specifically, this process looks to improve the vulnerability of these individuals from the armed groups that wants to promote for them to have the same rights as a common citizen. We don't set up any adverse feelings, but the idea is to, in order to get benefits, they need to choose the right things. We're setting up people to become citizens in common. How does the agency work? We work with 94% resources that come from the Colombian government. 6% 
of them are from international cooperation. But with the 6%, we accomplish a lot. The support from the United States, USIP, has been tremendous in helping us to innovate processes for improvement, not only in gender issues, in, in community, in productive education, etc. That 6% has allowed us throughout this 14 years to develop improvement projects. It's allowed us to generate different decision-making processes. If we compare the normalization and reinsertion that are for thousands of the FARC members, of course, ours is a much smaller universe, or the victims, the unit, which are eight million victims, but it has allowed us to have innovations, to have progress, and that's what we're talking about in the process for reintegration. What I just mentioned is we look for people to have the same rights and opportunities as a common citizen, and we work with a territorial group. We understand, and the agency goes to rural areas as well as urban areas to work with them. We have a presence throughout the country. Colombia has 32 states. We are in, uh, in most of these. We have 887 municipalities, which is where we have a lot of populations. Our model doesn't promote that people go to the offices. No, we have professionals that are spread out throughout the Colombian territory. It's important for all of us that in this process of reintegration, we need to look at the necessities of that specific area at work, at schools, in different areas. It's important for us to be able to reintegrate these people logically, not from Bogotá or Medellín or Cali, but in the rural areas. We organize at different areas in different states. We understand that reintegration is not our ex exclusive responsibility. It's a responsibility of the local or authorities, the municipal and regional authorities. And that's why we work on development plans. And we do it because we need to have these people have access. The model is based on public access and offer. We don't have a clinic or we produce offices of health or education, but we promote access to the local communities. We develop, thinking about these international groups where we help with human rights, we have a multi-dimensional aspect, and we set up eight different dimensions that we consider where it's much more important to work as to the vulnerability of individuals. And it's this way that we follow individuals that are in the process of reintegration. About 93% of the people that come into our process have been affected psychosocially. 90% of them are able to get over these problems with the psychosocial problems. We're not saying that they're crazy, but we're saying that they have PTSD, that they have depression, they suffer different illnesses, mental and physical. 80% or so are able to come forward through some of the professional reintegration group that helps them. And it's like a coach. It's somebody that follows the person through the point when he starts the process until the end. For us, perhaps it's one of the best learning sessions we've had because people need to have someone beside them. They don't need a constant monitoring, but they do need someone to coach them, to help them through. We've developed a model as well by the health ministry that's allowed us also to generate different services, health services. The recruitment, 12 years, they're normally in the group, 15 years. So we're talking about people that, for one reason or another, had to be part of this war, that are victims, just as we've already said this morning, as Dr. Pinto just mentioned, but that are also are people that didn't have the opportunity that a common or normal citizen would have had. As far as education is concerned, 95% of the people that we receive in the process are illiterate. That's a product also of the fact that they were recruited at such ages. With the help of another country, we've also developed a model for the adults with the help of USAID that is now going into more areas of the country. Nowadays, we're implementing many areas in the country. It's a model for education. 
to the benefit not only of those in, in the process of reintegration, but different communities, victims, children, adults, everyone. More than 21,000 people have already passed the basic education as a model. More than 8,000 have already gone through high school, and more than 15,000 have gone into further education. And talking about technical issues, more than 2,800 have already gone through this type of education. As far as the dimensions uh, that we've understood, is that we have to understand the logic uh, in the mind of the ex-combatant. Not everyone wants to become educated. Not everybody has a different vocation to become a businessman. And obviously, this is part of the model that we're setting up to identify which of the people have the ability, the potential, to go forward, to learn. And we did this based on the mistakes we made. Before 2011, the number of business units, productive units that survived were very low, even though we didn't expect that. But since 2011 to 2016, we developed a new model for follow, follow of all those business units. We did a fellowship to more than 95% of these business units. And today, we have more than 61% that have survived of the 5,000 units that were carried out back in the 90s, only two survived. Of the one that were done back in 2003 through 2010, only about 10 to 15 percent survived. So that model let us know that we have to coach these people. We have to follow them. That project, the productive programs can not only be just at the beginning, but it has to be the end. One of the mistakes that were made back in the 90s was to understand that for individuals to be reintegrated into the citizens, you had to give them the H million pesos. And that was part of the lessons learned of the errors that we made. And this is why we are applying these new methods. We also understand that people who are in businesses working have to be followed. For example, today 70% of the people in the process are working, 71 in the informal sector. It's only 28 to 29% that in the formal sector of business. And that is the same situation throughout the country. The information, inform, informal area is much greater than the formal. 650 com companies work with us. We not only do reintegration with these ex-combatants, but we also work with a model for community reintegration and also for re prevention of recruitment. Because we understand that if we don't break that violence cycle that are lived in different communities, then the cycle will continue. In the last five years, the public forces have neutralized approximately 5,000 individuals who belonged to the criminal organizations. And only 10% of those were demobilized individuals. So it mentions that this recruitment of minors is something that's continuing. And the my traffic, the criminal organizations in areas that are much more vulnerable and more complex. And it's usually the young ones that become part of those groups. And that's why we developed this international program. Today, we've been a benefit to more than 2,500 people in these models for prevention of recruitment. And more than 19,800 people in the models of reintegration to the community. Because we understand that this issue has to be worked from each community, and that each community has to be a part to be a benefit to these models. As part of the lessons of this health model, other than the fact that we also coach, we also give them public services. Thanks to the unions, for example, a lot of people are now working in uh, areas where they're contributing to society and others are still learning. In the year 2003, we had a study of a model or an, a, a uh, model of the possibility of recurrence, and 86% of people are still within the legal part of law. Now, we're not saying that the other 24% became a part of an armed group or a criminal organization, but the agency has a model that's very strict as far as, as the fact that they have to follow the lessons and accept the process. Someone 
a father that doesn't pay, for example, for the, the children, then we are trying to make them better citizens. The study that was done in the year of 2003 went much further, and it showed that the potential recidivism was under a large percent, and those we were able to prove that these people that recriminalized or had recidivism was 3%. So the model that we are giving is compared to, for example, a jail. In jail in Colombia, a prisoner costs approximately $6,000 and has a 13% rate. Reinsertion is about 2000 a month. And ex success is more than 76%. So that shows us very clearly that jail is not the ideal for re-socializing individuals. Someone that doesn't get into the reintegration process has three times more the probability of recidivism and also of being murdered. And it's a voluntary process. But we've also developed a model for post-monitoring. And we say to people, we give them the average time of maximum duration for this should be 6.5 years. That's the only public policy that actually graduates people that are become or are a part of the process, 6.5 years as a max. After they finish the interrogation process, then what we tell people is, do you want us to go along with you for two or three more years? If they say yes, then we do it. 76% have accepted that. So what do we do? We do a qualitative, quantitative evaluation. What sector is he in? How is the family doing? Because we also not only reintegrate the combatant, but also the family, the children. Because we understand that the family is, what is part of this whole process. As far as co-responsibility, perhaps one of the lessons learned, or the best lesson learned in the last 14 years, and we can't do it alone. We need to organize with other regional activities and governments, with municipal organizations, but we also have to do it with the businesses. But we go even way beyond that to understand the fact that we have to make these people employable. We have 106 organizations we work with, and we tell the businessmen, Use whatever source is best for you. It's to volunteer, they want to work, donate their time to help education, productive work, and reconciliation. Those are the issues that belong with this co-responsibility we're looking at. What are the challenges today as far as co-responsibility? We have to go way beyond then the amount of people or the sectors that we work with as far as reinsertion. These segment stigmatize these people, as particularly in the FARC, the stigma that has been applied more than help for 5,000 people have died during this process in the last five years. And not to not use the experience it's learned and lessons learned in the, during the last 14 years. As far as the, the issue of reincorporation of people into the society. This is a process constructed and should be constructed based on the interest of the different communities, of the individuals from the FARC, that the communities that are accepting them into their community. This is a co-construction. You know that the peace agreement says specifically what the process is for reincorporation of these individuals. It's a process that we have to construct with them. To give you an idea and a framework of the context, El Consejo Re Regional de Incorporación is a, an organization with the change of name of this agency is affected the institution. It's still the same, however. And as far as this organization and the issues of reincorporation, there's two FARC members, Jairo Quintero, Pasaral Alquim, and on the government, we have the High Commissioner for Peace, Rodrigo Rivera, and the director of the agency, which mean and what does the council actually do? They're the ones that determine what are the different activities to be developed, what are the time lapses, what is the timetable. This council sets up the lining. And what is the validation given to the productive projects that we're carrying out? Throughout this process, in the last five months, 
We've developed over 46 different sessions of CNR, and we've had a lot of advances. The first thing that the council had to do, which is one of the most important achievements at this new framework, is to build trust. Why was it different? Because when we set up just public policies, now what we have to do is to start from those bases to build trust with the FARC, understanding their needs, the needs of the communities in the areas where training is occurring, but also understanding the motivation and the new focuses that are being used in this new model of reincorporation. So what has this council done? Developed advances based on the model of early reincorporation and tried to set up the foundation for the model at a long, in the long run. When we talk about early reinsertion, we're talking about the different measures and actions that haven't been taken at the beginning that have to be developed within individuals from the FARC so they can begin to adapt to their new context, to the fact that they're going to be citizens, to coexistence with the communities they're going to be living. One of the lessons learned, perhaps in the last 20 years, that to offer this publicly as far as health, education, in education, everything that we're offering them are the bases that will allow them to eventually identify a path for themselves in order to become citizens again in the long run. It's to stabilize their lives. And we're developing this since 15 August when we receive different areas in the country through the 31st of December. Six months we've had to reincorporate these people at the first steps where we're going to understand the needs of the individuals from the FARC. What have we achieved during that time in the last few months is to have a process for these individuals to give them their identification papers to activate these individuals, to teach them as far as all the pension systems that are available. And nowadays, we've accredited more than 12,300 individuals from the High Commissioner of Peace Commissioner's Office. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see how we've been given continuity to the peace agreements, how we've effectively been able to have support, 2 million pesos, just once given to the individual, and three basic 90% of, of uh, minimum salary f during 24 months, with the exception that the individual receives employment. At that point, then, we do no longer give them that basic fund. And 8 million that perhaps have to be given to this project further on. So we've been able to develop some exercises for productive information, for education regarding community projects and economy projects, education. We've also worked on, as part of the areas of CNN, we did, had three senses. One, that was for education with Consejo Noruego Refugiados that helped us understand to what degree these individuals were in the different areas. A census on health, which is done with the health ministry, and a census that was also carried out with the National University that allows us to generally understand what is the panorama for individual, where are they heading, what are the expect expectations that they might have for their lives. You all know that there is a great cooperative which FARC has, Econum, Currently, we have gone along with the constitution of that group. We've had a education process with some of our allies, with the uh, Solidarity Economies, for example, Work Ministry, to try to orient this great cooperative so it won't fail. In this, by December, there have to be approximately 52 cooperatives have to be set up to for each one of the areas, so they will be part of that general common fund. As far as productive materials, we already have 26 professionals that are working throughout all of these different areas of the territory that are going to follow these productive viability of the sociability of these individuals. In other words, 26 professionals that with the, su the support of Pinwood have been working in all these territories. We also have approximately seven productive projects in different territories of the area. In summary, I'd like to mention that the, this incorporation council are the ones that are working in the region. And today, this reincorporation is being carried out in the areas that were given to them for training and reincorporation. In summary, 
let me say that the international, the cooperation we receive from the international communities follows us. And it's very important and very basic. The institution has to be strengthened so that the process will continue. That obviously it's a long-term process. This is not something to be accomplished in two or three months. Thank you very much. Please raise your hand. We'll take a group, and then we'll come back to the panel. P please feel free to direct your, your question as well to, to Chucho. Please identify yourself by name and by institution, um, and we'll take one, two, three, four, five, and then perhaps we'll, we'll wrap up. Okay. Thank you. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Good morning. I'm Beatriz Artur Parasal, represent an institute. I do not represent an organization, but I want to thank the presentation by Abad Colorado and the doctor. It's very interesting, all the efforts you're making, and Dr. Alvarez as well. I wanted to ask several questions. You're saying that FARC in 66 hadn't even been in the area yet. They hadn't been born, but I understood I think we sit in the 60s. Well, I think the FARC began about 53 with this Mr. Cano. Please, your question has to be very brief. It's important to clarify that this comes from the different parties, the liberals and conservatives, right? The FARC comes from those roots, not from the 60s. Something else that I thought was important is that the, the Pueblo Colombiano had the march that was marching against the FARC. That was the strongest march we ever saw. And the third thing that I thought extremely important to clarify is that the children recruited by the FARC, most of them were forced recruitments, forced. Today, I don't know, they may, they may have died, or they may be adults, and they're in a process that's excellent. But I have stories. I remember having heard not too long ago that some military individuals were in an armed conflict. And when that ended, there was a woman, a, gor a gorilla, and not to say that she's not a terrorist, was having a baby. And she asked the FARC members to the military to take the child because the child was going to die there. She'd been raped 18 times. So the stories are real, and I think that we have to talk from both sides, doctor, because we also have victims. 32,000, more than 32,000 soldiers have died, and they're Colombians too, that have families. So it's important to clear that up as well, and I'm sorry that I have uh, talked beyond my time. Thank you very much. Before answering, no, we're going to ask a couple of questions first. My name is Christina Spinel from Colombian Human Rights Committee of Washington. I'd like to ask a question for the Victims Unit. Your budget, how much is the budget in order to help with the psychosocial problems of the victims? And how much is destined to the adults and how much for the children? I know that it's different as far as the services that have to be provided for adults or children and families. Armando Boquera. I was a city councilman in the city of Bojoya, so when he took the floor, I got so uh, emotional. And uh, just as when uh, Julanda Pinto spoke, I am a victim of this conflict. And I've been here for the last 25 years. I haven't been able to go back to my country as a result of this problem. And thank, thanks to the current government who is bringing peace to us, um, our panelists are here with us today because this is what Colombians want. The pictures that you saw of my land, of my uh, department of Choco, I uh, was uh, moved by that because I lived there and a number of the members of my family were murdered by one or the other of the uh, armed groups or um, I'm not going to say if it was the paramilitary or the FARC, but these were outlaw groups that killed my family members. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Mr. Bernal from uh, Wola uh, here uh, in Washington, and I have a specific problem for Camilo about uh, the uh, reintegration of the ex-combatants of FARC. We're very interested in the uh, process that's underway as far as the reinsertion of uh, the ex-FARC uh, combatants uh, into society. My question has to do with the uh, mid-level uh, commanders. What are you thinking about doing as far as the mid-level commanders of the FARC, these uh, combatants who are so knowledgeable? What are you going to do to make sure that they uh, aren't uh, integrated into other criminal organizations operating in our country? Thank you very much for all of your presentations. I'm uh, Mrs. Tipo. I am uh, looking into the collective memory uh, issue, uh, and I'm uh, interested. I have a question for Chucho. When I went to Medellin a month ago to the House of Memory, Casa de la Memoria, in Medellin, What about the relationship? Do you have the impression uh, that people uh, are open? Uh, how have they responded to your work? Have they been open to the work that you're doing to keep alive the memory of this conflict? Uh, have they shown interest in your pictures uh, and also the reintegration process, which is uh, somewhat fragile? Do you think that the work done to preserve the memory uh, is this an obstacle in any way to the reconstruction process and uh, social reinsertion for the time being? Thank you. We'll go uh, in the opposite order of our presentation, starting with Camilo uh, for our answers. The uh, question asked from the gentleman from Walla is very important. Well, one of the things we've learned, without a doubt, is that uh, we do have to uh, follow through with these mid-level commanders. We're uh, working on this, uh, uh, working in cooperatives and uh, helping uh, them uh, integrate into the economy. We're also doing some training exercises and political participation with these uh, mid-level uh, commanders. We've done two uh, workshops at the national level in giving them the necessary tools so that we can uh, help them uh, use uh, their and we can avail ourselves of their skills. Now we want to assure uh, that ultimately they become multipliers of our efforts, our training efforts. And so uh, the people coming out of those uh, strife-ridden areas are two things that come to mind. You've got these training programs. Uh, this training is done in such a way uh, in which uh, people are free to come and go. Some people um, don't always uh, stick around. Now, there are those who are in far-flung areas, and many of these uh, places, people had to move to more uh, fertile and productive uh, lands uh, for them to carry out uh, the different activities, uh, farming activities, uh, in which they've been trained. Uh, but these uh, are areas uh, in which there's uh, free movement. We see the people. Uh, sometimes uh, exit these regions to visit their families and to carry out other activities. But when we've done the training for these people, they always do effectively come back uh, to uh, the uh, regions. So the, we're trying to uh, ensure that the information is conveyed in a broader way so that if uh, we want to make sure uh, that uh, they uh, aren't uh, incorporated into other armed uh, groups. Now, there is a story behind uh, each uh, person involved in this process, and uh, part of the state's commitment is in, is to respect the collective decision taken, uh, but we also understand uh, individual choice and freedom. And in this uh, exercise of working with individuals and collectives, we do understand that there is a role to be played and the contribution to be made uh, toward uh, this uh, pr preservation of memory. Beatrice, I uh, was also a victim of the FARC. I share in your pain. It doesn't matter uh, who victimized us. The conflict in Colombia was very cruel. 
The war was cruel. That's why we have to end it. There were uh, perpetrators on both sides, all sides. There were those who wanted to destroy themselves and uh, take us with them. And uh, certainly there were mistakes made by the Colombian state at times. But that's what we have to do away with. Uh, that's what we have to put an end to, so that nobody ever uh, takes, uh, tries to take uh, another Colombian citizen's life away from the right, from the left, or from the state. Those uh, different uh, actors uh, who have perpetrated violence in Colombia have uh, come from all uh, walks, all areas. We wanted uh, to do it with FARC. I also uh, uh, marched and demonstrated with you and many other Colombians asking for an end to the FARC, but the FARC uh, is uh, over as an armed group. And that is the best news for many Colombians. We have to do uh, put an end to the conflict with ELN that has also wrought uh, much uh, damage and do with all forms of violence. We have to continue fighting the criminal gangs. But cream, as they're known in the acronym in Spanish, this is just a, a residual uh, of the paramilitary groups. And we also have to demand that the Colombian state uh, fulfill and uh, follow through on upholding human rights. I also uh, am very pained by what Colombians have had to go through not because of what I saw on TV. I have been a direct victim of this myself, but I can tell you that I'm full of hope right now if all Colombians understood that this is a great opportunity that we have to build a country for everyone. We're just starting to do this. We can't say we have uh, lasting and stable peace yet, but if uh, all of the Colombians who have suffered from these uh, acts of violence, no matter who caused it, in this conflict, if we were all to commit to uh, doing our part to uh, help build this new country, I'm certain that we will uh, achieve it. And uh, I'm moved and uh, pained by your pain as well. Now, the other question as far as resources for uh, emotional or psychosocial uh, reparations. This is something that uh, has uh, been given top priority by my administration, that is to assist victims in their emotional recovery, to uh, help uh, victims to learn to trust again, learn to believe again, to believe that it is possible to live in peace, peacefully, and uh, to have uh, the hope that we can um, rebuild everything that was destroyed by this violence uh, to uh, build a new life for all of us that uh, will enable us to grow. So the resources for this uh, national unit of uh, victims uh, this year were over um, 1.8 uh, billion pesos. And so all of the different uh, measures in the implementation of all of the measures, one of which is rehabilitation of victims, which includes emotional reparations. And we uh, will have uh, sufficient resources for this process. We have a path forward. We have a protocol that we've defined working with people who are skilled and uh, specialized in psychosocial uh, care and uh, emotional uh, healing. And so after the administrative uh, part is done, we're going to focus our resources on emotional healing. Now, uh, the person asked me about my work in photography. I'm going to answer that question first. I would also like to thank my colleague, a fellow countryman from the uh, same area I'm from, Bojaya, who is here. And uh, my hope is that our uh, my pictures uh, will uh, 
make uh, emerge some positive uh, emotions. I've certainly seen tragedies committed by everyone, but I don't uh, take pictures that uh, would generate more hatred or vengeance, but rather that make us think. That said, friend, it's very sad that the issue of uh, Casa de la Memoria, the House of Memory in the city of Medellin, uh, isn't a part of this uh, collective conscience of a city because uh, this is a city and a society that is polarized. It's uh, a source of shame to me. It's shameful that everything that was invested in the House of Memory, there are some of my pictures hanging there, uh, bearing witness, uh, as uh, in many other places in Colombia that I'm not, I don't have time to mention, it's um, shameful that the administration uh, the last one and this one have not thoroughly understood that we uh, that uh, have uh, uh, fresh the memory sometimes uh, memory uh, serves to uh, spur on uh, and to also uh, highlight or showcase uh, those uh, who were involved in this. And so that's why people, um, well, memory uh, accuses, memory uh, interrogates us, memory showcases uh, what happened. And this uh, given administration hasn't uh, placed so much attention on the issue of the House of the Memory. There, It does exist. It was set up. But it isn't a part uh, of our daily lives. It's not a place where uh, people uh, necessarily go to visit, like uh, I, being here, went to the uh, Holocaust uh, Museum or came here. But the purpose of memory is precisely to uh, call into question what transpired, to educate us, to uh, ensure that we don't repeat the errors uh, committed by everyone. Work that I've done, my photographs, I think. I've been working. Uh, independently for the last 16 years, and I tell this uh, to Beatrice. Many things in my country, such as in Bocaya, uh, where the FARC uh, or the Peru military uh, were the responsible parties, but where the Colombian state could have uh, done more to prevent what happened and didn't. And that's why it was uh, taken into account. And I uh, have paid out of my own pocket to go uh, to uh, the confines of my country to take pictures. No one's uh, taking, paid me anything to uh, take a picture of Beatrice and to uh, say that here's her uh, memory now. There's another museum, Never Again, Nunca Mas. Uh, this is an, uh, an hour and a half out of Medellin. And the people in this municipality of uh, Granada can, who run this uh, place uh, will show you images of people who uh, were abducted and made to disappear by the FARC or the ELN uh, or the Colombian state. This is a shameful thing that uh, happened. Economic incentives were paid. So whether we're talking about scholarships or medals, uh, the war was something that we started to win in the minds of people. But the fact is, oftentimes, the way to win it uh, was uh, to, for example, when people in my country and many people uh, who were killed were then dressed up after the fact in uniforms uh, that weren't theirs. And this is something that's been uh, uh, covered uh, and dealt with in International Criminal Court. I'm a journalist, and journalism wasn't something that we've done to defend the left or the right. I was trained as a journalist. I have a first cousin who uh, was killed or uh, disappeared by the uh, army, another by the FARC. And I can give you the names and the places where this happened. When I tell you this, it, it, it makes me feel uh, hatred because uh, I've worked with this the agency that uh, Camila was talking about or the uh, reintegration agency of Colombia when I speak to all of them when I work with them and I learn the names of so many people in my country peasants victims or combatants still and uh, the, when I uh, tell you that I try to see their side of events because I want to understand I want to hear them and so 
I'm uh, very critical. The people we uh, see th that are most visible to us are the ones who are uh, carrying weapons. But they are also my brethren, and I speak of all of them. And I understand that the army is, uh, the, the legally uh, constituted army, has a lot of uh, decent and good people. And I salute, like uh, the case of General Mejia, who runs the Army of Colombia. Sometimes he uh, offers uh, lessons to journalists uh, who are still uh, imbued uh, in hatred, and he calls them out, and he says, uh, Miss, I'm sorry, but I think that the army is preparing uh, to build a country a peace. We can't continue uh, instilling hatred. So I think that the uh, army of Colombia is changing. But uh, journalists, whether we're talking about uh, preserving memory, it's not just to show uh, the bad things done by others, but the things that we ourselves uh, do that is wrong. And I know uh, many stories of peasants who were uh, put in uniforms, and we can't deny this, and or who uh, wore the uniform. And the problem is that we have a hard time uh, looking into the broken mirror of the war ourselves and seeing ourselves. And this is something that uh, should uh, cause people to uh, take their share of blame. And it's always easier to attribute uh, blame to uh, the armed parties. But there's a class of politicians in my country that when I see all the corruption scandals that take place in Colombia, when I see how uh, the judiciary itself uh, has become venal uh, and uh, is subject to blackmail and is corrupt, I say, how can I uh, look at children, boys and girls, and respect of uh, many of them whose pictures I've taken of uh, girls uh, that I uh, met recently, Beatrice, I just met a, a girl who's now 26 years old, the same uh, age my daughter has, that uh, was killed by the army. And uh, her five-year-old son and father uh, were also killed. And uh, she uh, went uh, into the army a year and a half later, uh, seeking vengeance. Now, if these fighters, uh, men and women were not having children as they are if they uh, they, they want uh, to love each other in peace they want to play a musical instrument they want to lay down their arms I've seen them uh, whether it's in the army or the police reaching out uh, to them but uh, we uh, sometimes are the ones not them who are perpetuating this uh, hatred and so uh, this woman with whom I spoke and many other, and I asked this woman who now has a daughter who was born last May, and I asked her, what do you want to do? Uh, and just to give you an idea of uh, what she's like, uh, for you to understand what I'm talking about, and sometimes trying to protect certain uh, entities, but this woman, and uh, this girl rather, in her little bag, and I was uh, having a discussion with her commander, and a discussion, uh, we're talking about the victims and uh, the perpetrators of crimes, and she, and they started talking about just the victims and naming them, and I was, uh, talked about Bocaya and other places where Eileen and Farc are, are operating, and I say we have to um, put a name on all of them. I don't belong to the police or the army. I don't uh, work for the government either. I'm a citizen, a journalist, and what I try to do is to reflect on society. And uh, now, this girl, what does the commander tell me? There's a victim here, he said. There's a girl here from the uh, gorilla. Uh, who has a press uh, clipping in her bag of a mass massacre in which family members of her died. And I asked him, uh, what fact are you talking about? And he told me. Now, she cries, he said, because uh, in a plastic bag, uh, she has uh, this press clipping, as uh, many guerrilla fighters have uh, bags uh, and carry uh, memories in them. And I said that that was uh, documented by only one person. I was the only person that for four days was there uh, helping the peasants, 
trying uh, to find their um, dead family members in the mountain, mountains. And I said, well, I am a, uh, uh, a foot journalist, so to speak. I don't work in an office in Bogota or Medellin. Now you saw pictures that are taken on foot uh, on the ground with the victims, and oftentimes the victims themselves are uh, men and women who have uh, taken up arms themselves. The pictures I've taken are uh, something that uh, are there's pictures that I take uh, from my soul. Uh, now, when that press uh, clipping uh, was taken out of the bag, that was from the magazine Semana, and these were my pictures about the death of her family members. And so this little girl, after talking, You don't just go up to someone and say, show me the picture you have there. I wanted to hear her story. I asked her to tell me her story. And then I told her that story of what happened to your family. I'm the one who chronicled that story. I was the one who went to that community to help them find their dead. And she smiled. She didn't cry. And she showed me the press clipping. And uh, I showed her, uh, well, those are my pictures, because these are stories that we have to tell everyone in Colombia so that we can all look uh, at ourselves in that broken mirror. That's why I work to ensure that never again we have to go through what we've experienced. And I try to um, teach uh, this to many people. Beatrice, I was also a victim uh, as a journalist of uh, abductions. There was someone who was uh, held a captive with me who was ultimately uh, killed after I was freed. And I can't tell you how that uh, made me feel. So I don't just talk about one side or the other. I'm a journalist. I have two eyes. I have one head. But most importantly, I tell people I have learned to uh, see uh, with my left eye, because that's uh, in line with my heart. And I tell the stories of my country for people to understand that war is something we have to end. If we could do away with war throughout the world with these stories, uh, we would. But the only war I know is Colombia's war. And I know some very uh, brave people uh, in the police, in the army, in the guerrilla people who are good people with ideals. Camila, the girl with the uh, guerrilla group that now has a baby who's growing up. And I asked her, what are you going to do when this uh, whole process uh, concludes, and I uh, swear to you, because I remember clearly uh, my profession isn't to lie. I'm not cynical. And what she told me was that she wanted to work for the peace of the country to ensure that no more families were to suffer uh, the misfortunes that she suffered. And there's an army captain, she said, who has been uh, found uh, guilty uh, for this uh, act as well as others. And uh, so many of the pictures that I have taken in Putumayo, if you go to Bojaja today, I was there a month and a half back, the church there where that tragedy uh, took place, there are pictures of mine there, not pictures of dead people, pictures of resistant uh, people, of people uh, on the move. These aren't pictures of uh, remains of uh, dead people. What I've tried to do, and I say this once again to you, and I apologize to you, but these pictures are a part of a collective memory that the country uh, needs to know about. Because all the years that I've worked as an independent journalist, I, I'm not the voice of victims. I can't be the voice of victims, but I can uh, bear witness to uh, acts of barbarism, but also to resistance, to uh, force and the love of the people of my country uh, to uh, move forward. And I bear witness to that. I don't want to just talk about pain. I want to talk about hope. And if we, as a society, were more loving, and if we uh, trying to uh, put ourselves in uh, other people's situation, that would make it possible for us to move forward. And that's why I reject people who are uh, entrenched in this thought that there is a military solution. There is no military solution, not in Colombia or nowhere else. Because as you know, you know uh, who it is uh, who ends up uh, dying.
Now, Chucho mentioned Granada, which is a municipality in Antioquia that uh, where the FARC uh, and uh, ELN and uh, the paramilitary groups who were working there. Uh, so, Beatriz, I was there uh, in Granada uh, not long ago. I was there with the governor uh, after the destruction of that municipality. And uh, that uh, march uh, of the brick uh, that uh, Chucho showed us. And you know, for the first time in many years, there was a, a mayor was able to go to the 53 uh, walkways of Granada, all of the different uh, paths or roads of uh, Granada. Uh, and this was something that for many years no one was able to do. Uh, for the first time in many years, we could uh, come and go to all of the different areas of the city. That uh, goes to show that the war indeed has ended there. And where the FARC uh, was uh, merciless in that uh, whole region, I told uh, just a month ago all of the uh, citizens there, we can finally uh, go out and about everywhere. And the mayor of the city, who is of the the same political party of the former president, Rudy V. And uh, he told me, look, uh, we can go everywhere. These uh, people are no longer in our municipality. And that is uh, the true merit of having uh, ended the conflict, the war with the FARC in Colombia, at least with the FARC, because the FARC was one of the strongest, most violent and aggressive and lasting uh, guerrilla group that we had in Colombia.